go ahead and get ourselves started with session eight of 120D, 220D. Today we got a lot of fun stuff to talk about. We're going to sort of wrap up just a few special topics in thinking about building envelopes and energy use and some things just to get you to thinking about as you design your envelope. And then start moving into really the relationship between your structure and uh, the building envelope and kind of all the different ways you can start thinking about that and at a very high level coming up with an overall structural strategy. So depending on the shape of your building, there's a lot of very high level moves you can make that are really radically kind of change the way you can approach supporting all the different structural needs. But let's just kind of check in first on sort of where we are relative to the projects. And uh, I'll just what you should be focusing on this next week. Okay, the idea is coming out of this week, we should be going ahead and meeting and talking about, oh, that whole point where I think that your preliminary design is getting fairly complete. And by that we mean that, oh, the main spaces that are sort of located, the cores are located, and the overall layout is going to be pretty good. And even in terms of the building envelope, you start to have preliminary notions of building, where the glazing is going to be, where the solid surfaces are going to be. There's still a lot of what we can keep on doing in terms of articulating things about shading or different sort of window conditions or adding some skylights to it. But we're trying to get a lot of that stuff sort of um, moderately nailed down so we can start moving this next week into really just illustrating what your structural framing strategy is and what your elements are. If you look out there on Canvas, there's a little more of a description there about like uh, the type of things to be including this next week as you sort of be thinking about things. Uh, let's go over there to Canvas and see what we got. So under structural systems, what are we saying? Go ahead and be thinking about your materials choices. Is it a wood structure? Is it a concrete structure, a steel structure? Some of those different combinations that are possible. Um, that's often sort of related to the whole notion of where your structure is going to be located, where you're building it, what the local building uh, practices, you know, as well as really what the structural needs are. But we can really often combine materials in very creative ways to kind of at least locally appropriate. We're going to think about the placement strategy for your structure. We're going to talk about that a lot today in terms of as we think about the structure, is it inside of the skin, is it outside of the skin, or is it in line with the skin? Okay, and this, you know, depending, depending on your material, a lot of ways that we would approach that. We'll look at some examples of different ones. You'll want to think about really, there typically is some sort of a structural grid that gives you an organizing medium for how you're going to lay out your columns and beams and just how you're going to think about approaching it so that it's not random. There's usually some uh, basic grids that we put in place. Then you'll also start thinking about some structural elements. Typically starting with the columns, where some of those elements and structural walls will be, some of the things that are supporting the loads, and then where your major beams are that are going to support the floors or support the roof, something like that. Okay, so that's the kind of stuff we want to be thinking about this coming week. And push your model as far as you can relative to that. Everyone's kind of a slightly different spot, but you know, you're, you're somewhere here, plus or minus, some small delta, but everyone's kind of sort of in that range. And as we think about this, just as a preview of what we're doing, What's going to be happening is you're going to start by basically laying out kind of some structural elements according to a strategy you have for the overall structure. And then the following week, we're actually going to do the analysis. We're going to choose some portion of the structure, analyze the members, and try to get some sizing out of that. Now, as you're putting your structure in place, you're probably going to make some initial assumptions about, oh, how deep you guess beams will be. And that's going to be a good starting point. The analysis will either affirm and confirm those sizes or tell you that you need to uh, go ahead and change the sizes a little bit. But chances are, you know, the structural elements will stay in the same location. The sizes may change. So that's kind of what's coming in the week ahead. Okay. Also in the week ahead, there is another little uh, kind of exercise out there. This is actually a very straightforward one that I think you'll be able to do just fine after we kind of look at what we do in terms of some of the examples today of different structural systems. What this one's asking you to do is for a simple building, going through and just uh, putting a very basic wood frame structure, concrete structure, or steel structure inside of it. So let's just take a look at that assignment. I think uh, what the TAs originally asked for was to come up with two of the different systems. And we'll show you some examples today that'll really make uh, kind of short work of that. So under structural systems, basically there's a sample building out there. You're supposed to create your own. 
Actually, no, it looks like it sounds like, looks like this one you're going to do your own, just kind of straighting, creating it from scratch. Here I'm going to create a little rectangular structure 20 by 50 wide with two of the following structural systems. So create one in either steel and one in timber, or one in steel and one in concrete, or one in timber and one in concrete. And the only, the point of this is really just to get a sense of really how you connect together the members a little bit differently based upon whether it's steel, concrete, or wood. What we're going to find out is that concrete of all the materials is actually probably the most forgiving locationally in that if you think about beams and slabs, often what happens is the slabs and the beams can overlap because it's the same concrete, the reinforcing is kind of detail, kind of have a lot of connection. But when we're dealing with concrete, we have less of a problem with things overlapping because concrete's pretty fluid about what it's doing. Whereas when we're working with steel or timber, since they're kind of set sizes, we have to worry about whether things are overlapping and maybe either offset the beams to lower them below the slab or do things to avoid uh, just kind of spatial conflicts. So that's what's going on there. Any questions at a high level out there? Got a sense of where we're going? OK, beauty. Then let's go ahead and take a look at our topics for today. Okay, what I want to do is actually finish up on just a few things in the whole building envelope and actually share some examples with you because, oh, there's some different things about oh, green roofs, which I think are sort of interesting people are asking about. Um, there's some issues about energy analysis that are kind of interesting about in terms of what appropriate targets should be for your energy analysis and even under thermal performance, we'll take a little bit about how our values are computed the types of materials that contribute to our value, so you get a sense of where all that energy performance data is coming from. I want to start out with a couple examples of daylighting examples. And we actually put out there on the Canvas site many different examples for you to look at that um, have oh, different conditions that might be interesting. So, you know, for illustrating how to do a lot of different things, I create just Revit models that show little unit cases that kind of illustrate just how you might model in Revit different things that you want to achieve. So we've been doing, we built together last time, a lot of examples of side lighting. We kind of did some typical windows, we put some high windows up on a wall, we looked at a curtain wall, we looked at how you put a shading shelf, so something that's going to shade as well as bounce some light up in there. We even looked at a freestanding screen, kind of a breeze away outside. And there's examples, if you didn't get a chance to follow along in class, if you just want to see things like that in Reddit, you can open any of the examples and just kind of take a look at it. So for example, oh, let me go ahead and go on out there. Looks like there's this light shading, single and multiple. Let's go ahead and take a look at what we have out there in the file sets. So I'll go over to Revit. Let me close up some stuff from the last class session. Looks like I'm in the middle of something. Oh, got my dialog open right there. Close that. Close this. And let's go ahead and take a look at these buildings. Are they all still open? They might still be open in the background. Yep, this is the last one. Okay. If we, for example, go on out there and under it's session eight, so if you go to session eight and 120 and go to the daylighting examples folder, you will find a bunch of sample buildings, typical view windows, curtain walls with deeper shallow overhangs, single light shelf, multiple light shelf. So for example, if you're interested in the single or the multiple light shelf, you can just open up the 4B example. What this is, is a very simple little building. You can sort of see it in floor plan there. It's kind of like four classrooms in a hallway with a lot of uh, just lighting conditions all around it. So you can take a look at, oh, for example, if we wanted to do sort of that curtain wall with multiple light shelves, just an example for you to work from. Let's see if it will open properly for us here. Looks like it's trying. Looks like something was supposed to happen there. There it is. So here's that little building. On the back side is kind of a curtain wall, just a standard curtain wall, the storefront curtain wall. On this side, on the south side of it over here. Good day, sir. Okay. 
we had the example of just that light shelf. So if you were wondering how to build that and thinking about doing something like that in your building, feel free to kind of adapt or copy elements out of this model and pull it in your model. Okay. In the same sense, oh, we put together a lot of examples in here in terms of top lighting, because skylighting and how you get light in from the top is actually pretty interesting to me. So there's examples of flat skylights, either a lot of small skylights or a few large skylights, or shed skylights, the kind that we have up here in the Y2 YouTube building. I know several of your buildings have those. A lot of the people are thinking about doing some sort of a shed skylight on the top. So if you're sort of wondering how to implement that or thinking about the details of that, go on over to, there's few skylights, there's mini skylights. You can sort of see in the little teeny tiny thumbnail, there's a, oh, what is it, looks like six, 24 skylights in this one. You can say a few large skylights. You can sort of look at the effect of just putting uh, two skylights in each room, so eight all together. The way I built all these examples is really to test daylight. So if you want to, open these up, run the daylighting tool, and you can sort of get a sense of really what the effect is of bringing in light using some of these different strategies. Okay, what I was going to look at is shed skylight. I have one that has glass walls, one that has opaque walls. Let's talk about both those. And then Carl, when we were talking, we talked about the shed walls and whether they should be glass and whether they should be opaque. And the big issue tends to be really how much of a reflecting surface you have. So let's just kind of take a look at how you can sort of see that in Revit. Okay, so this is example 6A. It's really just made of a series of curtain walls around the side and something called slope glazing as the roof. Let's see where that is. Where are you? There you are. So I have a bunch of shed skylights in here. These are just curtain walls, which are up on top of the roof. This element on the top is something called sloped glazing. So it's a roof type, but it's a roof type that actually has mullions to it and looks very much like a curtain wall just turned sideways. Okay. And the way most of these were done was we took a wall on the outside, which was actually going taller. Let me detach that just so you get a sense of that. I'm going to detach it. There needs to be a button there. There we go. Detach all. So this is what it's going to look like before you attach it. It should just be a tall skylight kind of poking it up out there. And the idea is you put the four walls around, you put the slope glazing on it, and then when you want to sort of make that uh, angle, you can go through and attach the top to the slope glazing. And it'll chop it off for us. It's going to give us a little warning here. What's warning us about is that these mullions, which are up here at the top, are orphaned. So they're going to delete those because there's just nothing to do with those anymore. So that's good. Now, this skylight is actually a good one to illustrate the whole concept of really how you want to think about the sun sort of hitting the building and why glazing versus opaque skylights sort of work. What I'm going to do is just to sort of illustrate it. I'll cut a section through the building, just so you can get a sense of what it looks like. Oh, just kind of with all the vertical relationships. I'll just cut a nice section right through here. And we'll take a look at that. So in this section view, I'm going to pop that out of the way. And shade that or something like that so you can see a little better. Here's the basic issue. Daylighting, or at least sunlighting, tends to come from the south side because as the sun moves from east to west, it's going to swing into the south side. Daylighting comes from all sides. So this is kind of an interesting strategy here. In this strategy, sunlighting is kind of being captured by the sloping surfaces. It's kind of coming just from that one side. So the sun typically is over here somewhere, and the sunlight's kind of coming on in. 
hitting all that. The sun rays kind of come on in. They're doing whatever they're doing. Okay. Daylighting is actually omnidirectional. So it's a little bit strange to think about it. It actually comes in from this side. It comes in from this side. It comes in from that side. It comes in from all sides. So as you think about daylighting and really what happens is it goes through that opening, it sort of spreads out like this. It does this. It does that. It comes over there. It spreads out in all directions. Where sunlight doesn't. Sunlight only does, it's very directional. It comes through. And what's going to happen is all the sunlight coming here is actually going to miss. So all the sunlight coming through this portion of it's actually even going to miss the opening. It's really only the sunlight that comes through the opening right here that's going to come. And what's going to happen is it's all going to land over here on the floor. Okay. It's going to bounce. So it'll bounce up a little bit, then it bounce over, and then bounce back over here. But it'll tend to be very bright over in that corner. It won't necessarily be bright throughout the entire room. Depend on what, where the sun is at different parts of the day. So the issue with kind of doing skylights that are glazing like that, you get a lot of daylighting in all directions, but the sunlighting effect is sort of not as broadly dispersed as you might like. So that's why, as opposed to doing kind of the skylights which are glazing on all sides, occasionally we do skylights that are opaque on the side, which sounds kind of strange, but it's sort of a trade-off. So let me go ahead and do the opaque wall skylights. So if we bring it on in here, it'll look very similar to the other one, although the walls won't be glass. There'll be some sort of surface that'll have like a white reflecting on them, something like that. Let's zoom on out there. So this is more of an opaque surface. Let's kind of cut the section and we'll do the same thing. Take a look at there and just analyze how it's actually working. So I'll say view. Cut on through here. We'll take a look at that. Okay, in this view, let's think about what's going to happen to our daylight and our sunlight. So in this scenario, let's do the daylight first. The daylight comes in from all directions. Okay, hmm, blocked. Kind of get in there. Looking good. Looking good. Hmm. Kind of semi-block there. But daylighting, it does have an effect. There's a certain amount of northern daylighting that's getting blocked right now because you have an opaque wall there. Okay. Let's go ahead and do the sunlighting. The sunlighting does this. The sunlighting is coming down over here. Hits a reflective surface. It comes on down and bounces back into the room over here. Over here, bounces down, comes over here. Over here bounces and comes over here. The net effect of all this is that you lose daylight, but you gain sunlight. And in the scheme of things, oh, daylight is like 800 foot candles or something like that. Sunlight is like 6,000 foot candles or something like that. So it tends to be a pretty good trade-off in terms of cutting some for the other. So opaque well, shelves, things like this do a pretty good job of just dispersing it. The other nice thing is, because of the reflections, you get daylighting in the parts of the room you weren't going to get if it was just a slot. Okay, so that's the reason why you just try to always think about having some sort of reflective surface. So that's kind of the big principle with the daylighting on the roof that you want to think about. There's another example I want to show you, though, that'll sort of illustrate kind of that point also. It's this whole notion of light slots. Let's take a look at that. I'll say a light slot at the center versus light slot at the wall. I'll open up this one over here. Okay, light slots are just like small skylights, small skinny skylights. They could be like 12 inches, 18 inches wide that go across a long distance. And 
just to simplify it here, let me kind of I'll make this same model work for both cases. Let me do this on the, on the plan over here. Right now, these slots are kind of uh, in the center, or they're on the wall. Let me go ahead, and I'm going to push that one to the middle over there just to kind of illustrate the difference. OK, I'll go through and cut my uh, section again, just so I can take a look. View, view, view. Section. I'm trying to create a railing right now, which I don't want to be doing. Let's go back again. View, section, cut. So here's two different versions of a skylight. Let's kind of think about both of them and why they are different. This is the more standard skylight over here. This is the one where we kind of put a skylight in the middle of the room. It's kind of doing OK. So if I go through and do the daylighting sort of thing, it basically is, again, going to get light in all these different directions. Kind of goes out in a nice radius. If I do the sunlight thing, though, what happens is, again, sunlight comes here and goes all the way through. Sunlight comes here and goes all the way through. OK, but then it gets blocked on the other side. But the net effect of this is you tend to get this bright spot that's kind of hanging around over there. OK, and, but that's the way we often do skylights. We do that, then you have that little bright spot that moves around inside your house, and you know, you're trying to like, uh, follow it to capture the sun. The other strategy, though, is to think about putting a skylight, it's going to sound weird, just right next to a wall. And again, the reason you like to put it next to the wall is okay, for the, uh, the daylight, you know, you're not getting as much benefit in that direction. This is still working in all directions there. Okay, but from the sunlighting standpoint, this is pretty advantageous because what is happening is when the sunlight comes through, it bounces off this wall, it comes down here, and then it bounces up. The way this always works, it bounces at the incident angle, so it would do something like that. Okay, so having the wall to bounce the light off of just gives you sort of more benefit because it sort of reflects. So light only, it sounds weird. It only does you much good if you reflect off things. But let's think about what you have to do to make that work. Okay, if you want light to be reflecting, give it a very bright color. Give it like a white, very bright color. It's going to reflect all the light back out. If you put a black wall over here, or even a gray wall, okay, it won't reflect as much light. Even if it's a concrete wall, it will reflect some of the light, but not all of the light. Okay? It sort of depends on the shininess and the roughness. There's a lot of things that go into why things reflect. But if you ever wondered why our ceilings typically are white, it's because we want all the light that's bouncing up there to reflect back down here in a very even way. So the thing that you can sort of do that will mess this up I'm bouncing off the wall, I'm bouncing into the room. OK, I got a floor surface here. So if I have a shiny white marble floor, OK, that light's going to keep on bouncing and bouncing around. If I put in there a black carpet, OK, the light's going to stop right there. OK, so the surfaces start to be important. Yeah, they're going to work them all together. Here's a kind of funny one, because it's, it's, it's very counterintuitive. Yeah. How do mirrors work? If you put a mirror on that wall, what would happen? It reflect the light. It's, you want to believe that. I wanted to believe that. You all want to believe that. But it actually doesn't. It's kind of a really weird thing. What mirrors tend to do is they reflect a lighted room. So you see light on that side, and it creates the impression that there's a lot of light. But the funny thing is, if you really kind of play with mirrors, they actually suck up all the light. So play with mirrors. At home, play with a flashlight in your mirror or something like that. They're not as effective as you think they are. They reflect the image of light, but they're not actually very good at replacing light. And I'll admit, I made a mistake with this. I was trying to do something with a lighting effect somewhere with some rope lighting and some mirrors that was going to be very dramatic. And all the light went right into the mirror and didn't bounce out. So mirrors were a little strange. They're very effective in dark rooms because they'll reflect a bright window, or in this case, it would reflect, you would sort of see the appearance of two skylights. So that would feel good 
but they're not actually very good at reflecting light. That's kind of weird. They, they reflect you, but they don't reflect light. It's kind of a very strange thing. Well, play with it. Okay. Let us go ahead then. That's our daylighting. Lots of cases to go ahead and take a look out there, but Revit models, feel free. Big, borrow, adapt, anything in any of those Revit models are there for you to play with. Okay, so there's a lot of cases out there for you. Okay, a second topic I wanted to kind of, uh, just kind of pull out before we leave building envelopes, it's kind of a good one, is really this whole issue. I can zoom on out here. Thermal performance, let's think about this. R values, I just tossed around that whole notion of R values and oh, somehow you have materials and uh, based on sort of linear relationship between the thickness of the material and ultimately uh, how thick the wall is, we are gonna go through and somehow increase the R values. And there is just a document I want to share with you that I think is sort of a pretty good summary of that that I've been using for a number of years. If you go to under thermal transfer, You'll find a document that says R value summary. And it's actually a really good summary just of really how R values work and how conductive heat flow works. The idea is that somehow between the inside and the outside, or between any two surfaces that have different or areas that have different temperatures, there's some delta T, there's some heat flow that wants to go through there. You have some material that is resisting that heat flow. And different materials have different abilities to resist it. Now, when you think about computing R values, it really is kind of an additive relationship. So if I'm going from the inside of the house to the outside, and I have gypsum board, and I have bad insulation, and I have plywood, and I have some sort of clabbered siding on the outside, we actually do we add them all up. So if we have the R19 bat insulation, which they say delivers a true value of around 18, the gypsum drywall, it only adds about 0.45, the plywood adds a little, even the siding adds a little bit. The majority of this is coming from the sheet. So we play games like this to go through and you know, figure out really what that is. If we really want to get precise about it though, we can't just go through and cut through here. We also have to allow for this path over here. Okay? And so if we think about the true performance of a wall, if you're really getting into energy modeling, okay, you actually go through and you start thinking about doing a weighted average. So for example, what we could do here is, if we really want to figure out that, this is interesting. It's that same thing. I'm going to see if this is going to work or not. Um, when I was playing around with my little tool over here and it did this in the last session, my Mac actually sort of shut down and restarted. Let's see what happens in here. I'll keep talking, but I may lose the recording here right now, and we'll see if this actually comes back. Okay, if we think about the path through this section, we actually have a pretty high amount of insulation here. It's a pretty good path. The path over here is not so good because that solid wood actually doesn't have a very good